بسم الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام Looked like my son got a word in before I did Yeah, yeah <laughs> Could hear him last episode a little bit well, Alhamdulillah no. It's good, it's good man um, Welcome to episode 58 of the Mind Heist podcast um, Muhammad, uh, how's your non-existent breakfast? Um, I woke up quite late, Achi, I'll be honest I woke up 10 minutes ago mm. Because... Uh, I was working until I didn't get home until three in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. that's that is that counted as overtime, or is that just what's expected? No, to be honest, I was meant to finish at two, and um, oh, okay. I thought I'd finish a bit earlier because mm. generally I do, but I just right. got caught up, caught up yeah. doing stuff. And okay, wow, so they meant is screaming the house that down. Is, like I said last episode, some good lungs, bro. <laughs> he, he's um, developed a bit of a screamy habit mm. Not that we're beating him up or anything I don't do anything of the sort Yeah, But he's just, that's his tantrum And I think a lot of it is, you mm. know excess, Especially these kind of mornings I, We yeah. tend to record on my day off So he gets a bit excited that I'm here And then I have okay. to shut the door on him and say goodbye Interesting, you know sometimes I wonder You know, like maybe people expect it Or they take it for granted Maybe my son won't even like me Do you think all sons like their fathers? Um, I have no idea. I like mean, they probably would definitely like their mother, but I don't know. I maybe maybe I'm thinking too much into this, but I just it's funny. I don't know. There, there's always an issue with parents and clashes and stuff. Yeah, I, I would expect to that to happen more. It. You know, when you're like 15, like when they become like 14, 15 kind of age. Uh, but when they're like five, six, like I don't know. We'll see. You know, last episode I said, I said, uh, nothing much has changed. Not too much has changed since I had a son. One thing that, another thing I didn't mention is obviously just the sleep kind of thing. Like, like it take, it used to take me like five minutes between when I want to go to sleep and then when I sleep. Hmm. Now it's like an hour. <laughs> so that's a, that's a, a difference, but it's not, it's not a big one. It's not a big one. What's, how do you think about the new year kind of thing? Uh, I don't, if that helps. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't really pay it much. Um, mm. So I'm sorting out my volume. I don't really pay it much of mind, really. Um, I know everybody's, you know, there's there's people that obviously celebrate New Year's. Mm. There's people that make New Year's resolution regardless of whether they celebrate it or not. Yeah. And then there's people like me that just didn't really realize it was even a new year until Mm. i don't know an hour after (laughs) yeah you know something i really get surprised by um i suppose because i'm living here i'm not like okay i've been to the uk a few times in the last like year or whatever but i'm not like into the culture if you like right and i just get very surprised how muslims for example christmas in the uk what i've discovered this year especially is that muslims actually they they really like christmas time and they see it as a chance to meet up with family enjoy time together because most people are off right and so they they're not celebrating christmas but they they do see it as a really good day because everyone's off work and they can all kind of chill together and i just thought it's a bit of a shame but i suppose it's just natural consequence of living in a i guess it's technically not a christian country but it is i mean if everyone's off work on christmas then you know, it shows the society is, you know, a Christian in some way. So, yeah, it's like Eid doesn't get that same thing, I feel, because people are working and all of that on Eid. Well, that's only in a, Mus- in a non-Muslim country, yeah, right? Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's what mm. I mean. I, I'm talking about the UK specifically. I don't know about the rest of the world. Maybe US is the same. But uh, it was quite surprising to me, you know. You never know, bro. Soon enough, one day, I'm sure there'll be... Um enough muslims to to make the argument that it should be a public holiday as well mm. yeah i mean uh i guess christmas is the only public holiday only religious public holiday for now right uh yeah yeah and that's yeah. probably you know it's all numbers isn't it yeah, yeah they say that like i remember reading a statistic like in 2050 there isn't going to be like i think a third of the population won't will be actually this is more race than it is um Religion, religion but yeah, yeah a third will not be white 
exactly something mm. like that in terms of the uk population yeah but you know the the problem with that it's it's actually really i don't want to say racist but it's weird at least yeah it is that if you're fully white then you're white right but if you're like a quarter black and three quarters white you're no longer white yeah yeah so yeah. you have to be fully white to be white but you don't have to be fully black to be black yeah i get and you i heard some people say like this comes down to the 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 subconscious idea behind it is that uh white is purity and it's it's pure you can only be white if you're purely white whereas if you've just got one fifth or one quarter of something else in you now you, you're not pure anymore so you're not you can't be white <laughs> yeah i get you you're mixed race yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind of kind of funny um so you're not even really aware of the new year thing what about me neither by the way but uh sometimes you can't avoid being aware of these things um especially you know dubai do all that uh fireworks thing and all that um but again i was surprised about how many muslims are saying not not necessarily saying happy new year it's not about that it's about they consider the new year to be starting first of january you know gregorian calendar and of course we use the gregorian calendar for day-to-day -day life you know organizing things mm. that's fine but it's just like it's i just noticed you know it's been so embedded in in people's minds in muslims minds that the year that the calendar is a gregorian calendar and the hijri calendar is literally just for ramadan like mm. who who even knows when muharram is who even knows mm. it's not obviously we don't it's not like we celebrate the islamic new year either but if you were going to do new year resolutions as a muslim wouldn't it be nice to do it at muharram or some kind of islamic related yeah. uh you know date you i know? think the layman muslim doesn't really know much about the hijri calendar and it's yeah sort of relevance and yeah. i think you know they just accept that we use the gregorian calendar yeah, and that's what yeah. they follow and then yeah. there's also the general layman muslim will will just say as long as i'm not harming anyone what's the harm in celebrating xyz mm. you know and i think mm. that's that is that has been one of the biggest sort of struggles in terms of giving dawah to fellow muslims mm. uh, with regards to certain issues because it's easy to tell someone or to advise someone to stay away from a sin if it harms either themselves or or others and, yeah. and you get that a lot you get that a lot so even if someone was to ask a layman muslim why don't you drink alcohol they'll probably first of all say oh it's bad for you and look what this effects have on society and yes. you know care there or care there and i've had this conversation at work uh, a few weeks ago mm. where it did come out like oh why don't you drink or why don't you you mm. eat pork or whatever yeah. And you know what? I actually said it to them. I said, you know what? If you ask someone else, they'll probably tell you first and foremost about all these negative effects mm. and, oh, it could bring cancer and you have no control of your body and all yeah. this stuff. I said, you know what? I'll be honest with you. First and foremost, I don't do it for any of those reasons. I do it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told me to do it. Yeah. Like that's, and, and that's what needs to be established. And I said, yeah. anybody can reel off a bunch of things, but all those things aren't necessarily going to be found in our scripture. Yes, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's what's found in our scripture is the commandment, mm. you know, and mm. and there is some wisdom. Like for example, in the Quran, it speaks about alcohol. There is some benefit for people, but the the negative yeah. outweighs the benefit. I'm paraphrasing here, but yeah. you know that could be said. But yeah. the bottom line is that's not what we're doing. It we're doing it because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mm. told us to. Yeah, that's the first yeah. reason. You and could this, say this... the second reason is the harm because you know we have the principle and and it's a hadith of la darara wa la dirar. Yeah, there shouldn't be any harm and there shouldn't be any. Uh, what's the word? Reciprocating of harm, and also the Prophet Sallam said uh, that alcohol is Umm al Khabaith, is the mother of all uh, mm. kind of filth or evil or whatever. So that's true in terms of the secondary consequences, but the initial problem is initial, when you're disobeying yeah. Allah, isn't it? And I think this is this talks more about that issue that we have as a whole about lack of tawhid in in the general Muslim's life because. Mm. Um, Essentially, what we're doing is putting importance on the loss of Subhanahu Taala's commands, mm -hmm. uh, and we're not putting a caveat on anything where we say, uh, "We need to understand why first, you know, yeah, yeah. or we need to give it a, a wisdom before we act upon it." Yeah. For example, like even fasting, actually, like 
people fast in Ramadan and they'll be asked, why do you fast? And we say, oh, it's good to have a break and we can sympathize with the poor and care yeah, yeah. there. You know, and it's that, you know, that, that might be a benefit. And we're not yeah. going to argue that really. Yeah, yeah. But the initial the initial command is to just do it, mm. and and it's mm. you sh- and I think that's what the issue is. We we lack conviction to say mm. because my Lord told me so. Yeah, because I, people think the thing is because the concept of submitting so much, like completely just submitting, just like I was told to do it, so I did it, is very alien mm. from uh, especially Western societies. Like you know, in you know East Asia, like you know China, these kind of areas. They have more of a culture of submission to a higher authority, not to God, but, you know, your parents or the leader or whatever. Yeah, they have more yeah. of that concept, whereas uh, well, the Western civilization is more about like freedom and like doing whatever you want. Right. So it's very yeah. um, alien, I think it feels. And so to get that kind of courage or whatever to just say, oh, yeah, I'm doing it just because I was told to and I just obey. Uh, it's it's yeah. interesting, actually, because it's interesting to see how I can't remember how a conversation came up about submission or or, or a conscience like mm. I, I was speaking to somebody in, at work and um, I think I said something out of the blue like I don't know how people without any sort of moral values or beliefs mm. stay on the straight and narrow because mm. um, I said to them I'm sure if I didn't have the 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 religion I had, mm. the beliefs I had, mm. that nothing would stop me from criminality mm. or stealing or mm. whatever. You know, just take. Do you what really you can think get. that? Yeah, probably. I think a lot more than because I I I, I just put it out like I've I've got the I've had like a bit of a crisis in my um in at work as well because you know we've spoken before about dealing with death and death comes in yeah. many forms and I've had a bit of a crisis where every time I deal with it which is quite often now um i have a bit of a i don't know a bit of a not an epiphany but just a very a very sharp reminder you know and it doesn't fade i'm mm. not getting used to it every time which mm. i was hoping i would because um because a lot of these people at least all of these people i've gone to have been non-muslims and then all i can think about is mm. the life of a non-muslim from start to finish Yes. and what what it kind of ends to and all these people the, the people i work with it doesn't really seem to affect them Every, everything's business as usual and i'm i'm a bit like having a bit of a crisis in terms of trying to put myself in their shoes and wondering what is the point like if i was them i wouldn't know what the point is of living do you understand yeah like and i thank a lot for the dean that i've got because i i wonder it's a bit dark but i wonder like if i didn't have this i don't know what the point would be because i'm spending all my time working hmm. I barely get to see my family mm. and um, in the end this is how I end up and all these people I've gone to have died alone it's like this is how I end up so what was the point mm. like why Why was do you understand like yeah. and people have this and, and I remember when I was at university there was I studied sociology which sometimes touches up on this issue and there was writers that wrote about these sort of topics to the point that they had existential crises and 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 either committed suicide or or te- attempted to because mm-hmm. they thought about it so much mm-hmm. that they they just didn't see the point in living anymore it didn't make sense you know yeah and um yeah essentially that's what we try to say like without this idea of submission it, it everything's a bit fruitless everything's a bit you know what's the point like you build you build and you you work and you you slave off in the dunya but essentially nothing mm, yeah. yeah i think living without a purpose is um it's a bit of a newer newer kind of phenomenon right and obviously mm. you know in the past sometimes people's only purpose was to survive and there was like the survival instinct and that was good enough right but yeah. when you live with more comfort then you need something beyond just survival right and then some people they have religion and then some people like more and more these days they they have nothing right and mm. and that's been going on for like a few decades but i i feel like um now uh, among western civilization like they're moving more towards they kind of realize it sucks right to have no purpose so they're moving towards finding a purpose and there are a few kind of movements that are popping up like you know jordan peterson talking about having a purpose yeah um, like that's why i think he became so popular because of that main reason you know he 
he kind of shook people up and said, no, you, you do have a reason for being alive. And they're like, oh, really? Oh, yeah, I yeah. love that idea, yeah. And but then just you to interject, have... okay, just yeah. to interject about him, have yeah. you seen, like, his his mental state recently? Oh, not recently, no. So I've I have followed him on Instagram. Yeah. And um, his daughter, I think, posted on his behalf, like on yeah. his thing. Okay. She was saying, oh, I'm really sorry he's had to cancel, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, he's going through a lot lately. And I was like, I keep hearing about him going through a lot. Like, what's going on? Okay. And I checked, I sort of did a bit of background. And apparently he's, you know, he was on antidepressants. He's suffering a lot because mm. of something. I think either his wife is very ill or his wife died or something like that. Yes. And basically he's been canceling all sorts of shows. He's right. been suffering a lot with his own mental health. Mm. Um a lot of issues, basically a mm. lot, a lot, a lot of issues mm. that he's struggling to get on top of. Yeah. And it, it once again just reinforces the notion that I'm not saying that having Dean cures you of mental health issues, mm. but what I am saying is that even someone like that, mm -hmm. who people flock to mm. for to solve these these mental yeah. mindset yeah. conundrums, is yeah. now going through something yeah. quite immense. Yeah. Yeah. You could say though that that could happen to a Muslim as well. You know? Of course. I mean, the the short period of time from which he be he was a nobody to being a uh, huge, uh, you know, big mm -hmm. deal, uh, that was a very short period of time. So I think for anyone it would be difficult. But uh, yeah, maybe you know we always we always know that you know Islam is the best toolkit for dealing with anything like this, and just something as simple as reading Quran every day it, it grounds you, it reminds you of certain things, what's important to humble yourself, all of that. So. I was saying, you know, people are flocking to him for purpose. And I listened to a, a podcast episode, uh, Mad Mamluks, about uh, deism, which is like the belief uh, in a god, but not religion. And, right. And the guy seemed to be quite into this topic. And he was saying that uh, this is going to be the new thing. And, and you know, it's, it's actually people are going to move away from atheism and they're going to move to deism where they believe in a higher power. Um, they don't necessarily believe that the higher power is involved in their lives actively. Um, that they don't believe there's any rules or anything, but it's just maybe some kind of comfort of knowing uh, maybe where you came from and the fact that maybe there's someone to call upon or something like that. Mm. So I think you know, obviously they're trying to work something out because it can't last for for that long having no purpose. It just don't it, work, it's, does it? It's the convenient god, isn't it? That's what <laughs> yeah. I'd argue that is. It's the it's the enough to give me comfort yeah. so that there is somewhat, you know, I'm not alone in this universe. And when yeah. I look up at the stars, I don't feel so insignificant. Mm. And if I'm desperate, then I can comfortably call upon something. Yes. But it's the, the God on my terms where yeah. I'm not following any rules and I want to live my life the way I want to live my life. And as Basically, long as I'm not hurting anybody. It's a, an, an idea of God or a concept of God that serves the human rather than vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. like, I'm going to think of God in a way that makes me feel happy. And if you come and tell me that God is a way that I don't like, I'll reject that God, you know. So, yeah, there, there's a crisis of purpose and stuff. And, you know, of course, uh, I think it's, who knows, Annie? I think we're, we're not that aware of what, what things are like in China, but... You know, China for many decades now has gone through getting rid of Buddhism, getting rid of religion in general. And, you know, I, what I hear is they're a very consumerist, materialist society. Mm. Um, and so I think they're going to, I don't know, they're going to have to work it out as well. It's a scary prospect. Um, funny, you mentioned China. I watched a, a short clip on maybe a 15 minute thing on YouTube yesterday mm -hmm. regarding... Um, the CCTV sort of facial recognition mm. Was thing that that's going on in China. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I watched that one. And they too, were talking yeah. about, um, obviously now they've they've got this technology where they can use it pretty much for anything. And it's similar to um, those security features that you find on an iPhone where it's like facial, face ID. Mm. Yeah, so you can unlock your phone with face ID. Yeah. Um, but they've gone, you know, because they haven't got the barriers that, that maybe a lot of Western countries have in terms of like, data mm. protection or yeah. you know these all these policies they can pretty much use it for whatever they want yeah. so they've got like um, obviously you've seen it they've got like public shaming of criminals that like jaywalk yes. or um, they have know, uh, 600 million cameras I think in China yeah so and yeah. The, the the interesting topic that came up was this notion of using it as like a social scoring system yeah so that your face would literally it was it's sort of like 
how we leave reviews mm. on like Uber or mm. Amazon or whatever, um, reviews would be left on us. So then yeah. we'd have social points, yeah, yeah. and it would it would essentially be like this dystopian future where, yeah. you know, your social points aren't enough to buy a cup of coffee mm-hmm. or or enter a particular mm. store, and it will probably be like that. Like you will need a minimum of I don't know a hundred social points to enter Starbucks, yeah. um, because if you don't, then you're too you're deemed too criminal to. Um, mm. And it's, it's, status, yeah. yeah, it's insane. It's essentially um, making people guilty, giving them no redemption. Like, how do you, re- how do you, uh, how do you uh, gain your social score back up if you're never given the opportunity mm. to? Well, you, you know, gotta, how do you redeem I yourself? I think you have to bow to the pr- picture of the president, and then you get a few oh, points like that. Just do <laughs> oh, that five God. times a day until you get your points up. It's it's incredible because that then that becomes more valuable than money in a sense yeah like social score would then give you more opportunities than anything like you could go yeah. to a job interview and they'll scan your face and they'll be like yeah all, okay got it yeah that, yeah i've got a social score of such and such okay brilliant you know <laughs> no um, cv bro just social score it's insane bro it's insane yeah. and that you know that's what reminds me of uh, it's a bit weird but it reminds me of this good deeds and bad deeds sort of Thing and how mm-hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will no doubt judge us on good deeds and bad deeds but it's almost like the system here is trying to implement that yeah in a way yeah because it's it's attaining it that sort of level mm. in people's lives mm. where it is in that it's, mm. especially in china for example yeah. it's like submit to the state mm. kind of thing mm. they have implemented it already to a to in some ways maybe it was a pilot in a certain city or something where mm. if you're social score goes below a certain point you're no longer allowed to book flights or um or use the high speed trains you got to use the slower oh, trains yeah. or you got to use the buses instead so they already implemented that so uh, it's kind it's of crazy. crazy man and i just think about it from the point of view of tawhid yeah so part of our belief is that um allah sees everything allah is aware of everything and um what that is kind of one of the reasons we're in awe of Allah and we feel that there's nothing we could hide from Allah and we're always mm. thinking, we should always be thinking about, you know, what, what, what am I doing and Allah can see it and is Allah going to be pleased with this? How that feeling, it's not the same of course, but the feeling of always being watched, is that not the same now in China when there's 600 million cameras and everywhere you go you can see cameras? It's the same feeling. It's literally... A form of shirk it's a form of feeling that this there's an all-seeing thing that can see you and that yeah. deeply deeply messes with tawheed bro literally yeah. even i i've noticed myself when i for example now in the uae every mosque has cameras in it okay and there's quite a lot of cameras all around everywhere and i just it just made me think like i'm sometimes thinking oh cameras can see me i'm not doing anything wrong but you know, just this feeling of always being watched, um, it interferes with your tawheed, I feel. Yeah, it could do. I wear a camera for work, mm. um, like on my chest. So I've got mm. one strapped there and I turn it on and off when I need to. Um, and it is odd because yeah, certain things you go to and you just have to turn it on mm. um, because of the nature of the incident. And you do, you do sort of worry like, oh, okay, I need to be on my guard or I can't say anything mm. not that I would anyway but it automatically makes you feel a bit like you're being watched yes um, the, um, you'd be surprised okay, I mean even the numbers in the UK we talk about CCTV and stuff um, a lot of those cameras don't even work a lot of yeah, those cameras yeah. honestly a lot of them are just there a lot mm. of them are dummies it's, mm. not, it's not that many I mean proportionately it'd be interesting to see how many are actually fully functioning at work and also in the UK there's a lot of legislation regarding cameras mm. for example um, it can't, you can't point it at someone else's property it has to be at your own um, mm. unless it's obviously like a police camera or something mm. um, but even like police cameras they can't they can't just follow people mm. so that's why like if you've ever observed a police camera for example it will just spin around on its own every i don't know however many seconds mm. it can't stay fixed at one point for too long unless there's a ground to justify it mm. which and and the same with like surveillance and stuff so mm. surveillance like what you would assume is you know following somebody because of something that mm. can't even be authorized unless a court signs it off first mm. and at least in the uk 
there's there's still strong elements of accountability between the court and the police system mm-hmm. so like the police would have to go to court and apply for certain things mm. and just because they're all one big entity of the criminal justice system doesn't mean they get along yeah because they're two separate entities yeah. they're kind of they fight with each other quite mm-hmm. a lot mm. like the police will say oh we need this we need to observe this person or we need to follow this person or we need a warrant to do this and the court will be like ah nah mm. and then it's just like a this argument back and forth yeah. until you know it gets authorized mm. but so, that that has its benefits though doesn't it oh that's what i'm saying yeah that's yeah. what i'm trying to say that yeah. it has there's still those things that are holding the the all yeah, out surveillance of people yeah. back mm. yeah which i'm assuming low island but i'm assuming doesn't exist so much in mm. whether it's china or any other sort of country like that yeah yeah that is that is something that we need more and more yani we desperately need that in the in the muslim world because Mm. You you need basically you need these independent institutions whose job is to implement the law and do their job for the betterment of the people of the country, independently of what the current president feels like or doesn't feel like. You know, yeah. like the f- number one thing is the justice system needs to be absolutely independent. It can't be that the president doesn't like someone and so yeah send this guy on a fast track right to prison without going to mm. court like it should all be uh justice basically you know and uh it's uh severely lacking in, in some countries it's, but, it mm. spreads on as well like to journalism as well i mean at the end of the day um it's a it's the balance between benefits and, and negatives because wow he's banging the door down he desperately wants to come in sorry um <laughs> Like so, journalism, for example, on the plus side, you could say that they're desperate for a good story, so they'll mm-hmm. do anything to challenge those in power or challenge the status yes. quo to write about some sort of big scandal or whatever, mm. uh, which keeps people accountable for their actions and make sure people doesn't don't slip. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like they're easily swayed to promote a particular agenda, just like everybody is. So you can't really be sure what the truth is. So that's like when it comes to news, for example, you can't mm-hmm. have a favorite paper. Like if you have a favorite paper, then you're always gonna. It's like what you said early um, in earlier episodes about having multiple teachers. Mm. Like if you read just from one paper or one news source, then you're only ever gonna get one particular agenda because yeah. their agendas tend to be quite uh, linear. Like a particular paper mm. or a particular Narrow, organization, yeah. yeah, only wants to promote a certain thing. But if you if you can read the same story from different angles, then you're more likely to get a rounded idea of what the arguments are not necessarily what the truth is but what the arguments are and where they're coming from sort of thing yeah 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 yeah. it's true man uh listen bro i wanted to cover another topic actually okay so whoops so we both have sons right and uh uh, i've i've been reading this uh well listening to this book uh in the past couple of weeks and it's one of the best books i've uh, read or listened to in months you know it's called boys adrift and so it's the five factors driving the growing epidemic of unmotivated boys and underachieving young men okay and it's really really been fascinating so i thought i could just take you through some of the ideas in the book and we could have a talk about it Um, it's something to think about for ourselves it's something to think about even people just you know a couple two three four years younger than us it's it's affecting them and then in raising our sons we we really have to think closely about this so the the first one he talked about was teaching methods okay and i think this uh, the author leonard sachs dr leonard sachs he um he advocates for girls and boys to be taught separately in separate schools because mm-hmm. he says the dynamics and what motivates boys and the way boys are going to engage with school is so very different to girls um, so he says, for example, girls, are, they do work better in school these days on average. They do better than boys because girls are motivated by um, being a good girl, if you like, you know, uh, uh, listening to the authority, to the teacher and pleasing the teacher. Yeah. So they will work hard and they're motivated just by, you know, being a good girl, basically. Yeah. Whereas boys have no interest in that. That's not motivating to them. Uh, they need to do and see and touch more. You know, they need competition, um, all of these things. So he said the very way that we're teaching uh, these days, it's more catering to girls. And that's one of the ways why uh, how boys, by some young ages, they just disengage completely from school. And once you disengage for a year or, you know, two years, you're kind of done, like you can't catch up. Right. So 
this was the first factor he's saying that is, is messing boys up is that the teaching methods are not friendly uh, to, to boys. And mm. so he talked about, for example, writing a story. Um, and I think a lot of the examples he's given are more extreme because in America, I think the stuff he's talking about is more extreme over there. But I just feel like America is like the canary in the coal mine and anything that goes on there is eventually spreading to the rest of the world. So yeah. he talked about creative writing exercise um, you know, like Lord of the Flies. Have you read that book, yeah, for school? No, I've never read it, but I've been okay. to. Yeah, so it's about uh, boys, a uh, group of boys that get stranded on an island, and it's basically how human nature kicks in, and uh, they end up... Uh, it's very, it's a very philosophical book, if you like, but it's just the story of boys and how they act, basically, when they're left alone. So, right. So um, he said, you know, a, a good exercise for a girl is... Put yourself in the position of this character and write how you feel, right? And this character gets bullied in the in the book, yeah? Ha okay. uh, explain how you might feel. He said, that's fine for a girl who's much more in touch with her feelings and she's much happier to write about feelings and she could kind of relate. He said, for a boy, it, it seems like the most stupidest thing possible. Like, like, who, how do I know what he feels like? How do I know this, this, this? He said a better, just rewording the question would help the boy out. So what would you do if you were that character? He said just yeah. changing that around would help boys engage more in the subject. It's still English. It's still literature, but it's it's just rewording it. So that was an example. The other example is boys getting uh, getting zero marks for writing stories about warfare with some like violent, uh, you know, violence in the story. He said right. some of these boys are getting given zero marks because of violence when it was purely suitable, Yanni, to mention violence. So the, this is the first thing he mentioned, like teaching methods, basically. It's like taming them, taming the wild animal. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of what it is, yeah. And it goes along with the, for example, I remember when I was in school, we had a lot of sports competitions and like we were divided into different groups like the whole school was in one of the four groups and then we would compete against each other in sports day and stuff like that you know and boys love competition yeah for sure it i wonder if that, does that even carry over into non-physical stuff though like you said for example creative writing yeah i suppose uh, from what i can remember at school it's quite there's different types of people though like even yes. in, in terms of boys there's different spectrums like yeah of course you'll have very sort of the macho boys you know mm -hmm. and then you'll have the ones that aren't so macho and a bit more studious and yeah so i'm, I'm trying to think if there's like a common theme across all or most boys mm. um I struggle mm. because, was, you know, like one thing, and I don't know if that's just uh, because of the way things are set up that we've fallen into these sort of groups. Yeah, it and could stuff. be, yeah. It could be an effect of that because I'd, I'd be interesting to see if these same sort of groups exist within an all boys school. Because mm. one thing I have noticed is that there is an element like the moment you, you, girls and boys together then a lot of behavior is exaggerated to impress the other side yeah like yes. you could have like a group of boys but then the moment there's a girl with them or a, a girls are interjected into that group mm -hmm. some boys start acting out and acting up to sort of impress yeah um kind yeah. of like a gorilla trying to <laughs> impress <laughs> press the pack or the herd or whatever you call them yeah yeah um, he did he did talk about the the benefits of boys being mostly together with other boys and with men and how they need men role models basically they need men to show them how to be men and yeah. if they have mostly like female teachers or they don't have like men in their lives they kind of don't really know how to become men i think that is the key i think that's the most Im important thing that i can remember from school mm. and like influence wise is that boys having male teachers mm. like good you know responsible and role model style teachers mm -hmm. i think that's the most impactful thing they yeah. could be and the um, way you bond with teachers sometimes it's it's often with sports it's often through sports team sports especially i remember uh doing different treks um i don't know if you did scouts i did scouts when i was uh, uh when i was more in primary school i think uh and that was really good no i, n I never did that unfortunately um 
but I do recall like you know some of the most influential teachers we had were like the PE teachers for example Mm -hmm. Um, they're the ones that had a big impact on not just it wasn't necessarily just the sports but it was the discipline you know, it mm. was the there was always going to be an element of discipline when it came to physical education. Yes, and like that's what you sort of remember the most, and yes. teamwork and all these sort of things that we value as boys, but never really get a chance or an opportunity to express them on a day to day. Yeah, and 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 I think the way they teach you and the way they support you, uh, if you took it seriously enough, and I think that's an issue. It's always been optional. Like it gets to a point where it's optional. Yeah. Like you either, unless you join up with a team, uh, then you're never really going to get that sort of deep yeah. learning or deep sort of mm. experience. Um, and I think a lot of confidence can be drawn from that. A lot of leadership can be taken from those kind of things. And I think that's why a lot of these modern sort of self help books focus a lot and appeal a lot to. Um, to sports personalities and, and those in teams and stuff a lot of these books that we've been quoting before they're all like all the rage when it comes to sports teams especially american like baseball teams and basketball teams and stuff mm. and a lot of them use those kind of examples because that's kind of where this modern day society that's where the men are really found in terms mm. of of uh you know tenacity and, and experience and and living out these sort of uh what we'd call transformed war sort of modes i guess like you can't really express your wartime man mm. in, in anything other than sports yeah so that's where it flourishes yeah you know? yeah yeah i remember uh growing up i had two two sports that i guess i took seriously uh one was karate one was rugby and again like you said the discipline that i got from those is incredible mm. even though now i think karate is a bit you know soft but <laughs> but the discipline is is the main benefit yeah. really and i was i was doing rugby taking it quite seriously until like age 17 and, and you know that was tran- really transformational i think you know i don't know you know sometimes i look at other people who didn't really do a sport and i just think how much more disciplined would you be if you had done done a sport Mm. you know especially if through those years like i don't know maybe 13 14 15 16 kind of this age um keeps you kind of straight you know you've got you've got a man who's coaching you and when you mess around he sets you straight and these kind of things so yeah and it it teaches you a lot in terms of like there's a lot that can be applied to uh to -to day-to-day sort of obstacles for example like if you're always on the offensive then it mm-hmm. gets to a point where you're just back bashing your head against a brick wall. Like you could be up against mm-hmm. a team that has just got such a solid defense that just constantly mm-hmm. attacking, attacking, attacking isn't going to really do anything. Like you're, you're just going to tie mm-hmm. yourself out. And then that's when you start learning about patience and you start learning about looking for those opportunities and looking yeah. for that sort of chink in the armor and, and, and a weakness yeah. and stuff. And I remember, I remember even because I used mm-hmm. to be, I wouldn't say in a hockey team, but like I just used to play hockey a lot. There was never enough people to create a team, and I always wanted one. I really, really, really wanted to start a hockey team, and I had a few people with me, but there just wasn't enough numbers. But like I remember playing that and really enjoying that and really being good at that and getting to points where it's like, okay, we need to bide our time. We need to look for who's the weakest player and sort of rush them with mm. the ball so that we can get through mm. a lot of these things. So, yeah, you start mm. thinking about tactics. Uh, you start thinking about more than just yeah strategy yeah, yeah patience yeah 100 yeah, percent, man 100 percent. so that was the first one teaching methods um and i think yeah it, it's not a coincidence that boys are failing more in school um in school and university actually there are more girls in universities in many countries now i think than boys um uh, and yeah uh, it could be you know really due to the he talked a lot about the disengagement, you know, at a certain age, boys, he said, boys get the feeling that school is just not for them. It's not designed for them. It's not set up for them. And so rather than keep failing, they just give up. They just disengage mm. and that they, they, you know, start saying school is just stupid, which obviously simple language to basically say that it's not for me. I'm not welcome there. When I express myself in my way, I get zero or whatever, yeah. you know, so that's teaching method the the second which is a bit surprising to me was video games Ooh. okay brace yourself and 
<laughs> he talked about he talked about how video games obviously they're very addictive and there are a few you know, negatives that you get from video games so firstly when you're playing a video game you're not engaging outside you're not engaging with other people right right so you're not you're not learning to interact with friends you're not learning how to you know like play a team game in real life outside you're not learning your social skills you're not you know doing all these things um that's a that's one of the, the first one the second one is that it's so addictive that it can actually take over your life to the level where you're not willing to do your schoolwork. you're not willing to get a job you're just kind of just want to play pretty much um the third thing he said is that a lot of these boys that he because he's a therapist right so He's a psychotherapist oh, right. and he, he has a lot of clients like this. And he said a lot of them, these boys, they're happy to just play games. And we're talking about non-Muslims here, yeah? So they have, he said, some of them have no interest in girls. Yeah. Like a normal non-Muslim at that age, he's talking about, you know, 15, 16 kind of age. They'd be interested in in, in going going to girls, playing, uh, not playing, hanging out with girls, right? He said that some of them have zero interest. He said... Even some girls that age, they complain that um, when we, we, you know, we go to parties and the boys are just all around the TV and they're just playing games yeah. and they're just watching each other playing games. And the girls are like, you know, they're like uh, they came for a social event, Yanni, but there's no yeah. social event. It's just games. So he said, you know, it also it basically it also is kind of a replacement like boys he said because they often feel disengaged in school they feel like they can't be this hero that a lot of uh boys yeah. want to be and so they think at least i could do that in the game yeah definitely and i think you kind of mentioned that before, yeah i think you? uh for for a lot of different people it serves a different purpose um uh, for me it's always been a element of escapism um i wouldn't say like mm -hmm. so everyone's different like i think there are people that, that don't engage with society at all you know and those are quite extreme mm -hmm. end of the spectrum the i think my issue mm -hmm. is that i probably spend too much time engaging with society that i do want to be transported somewhere else you know when i get back um another thing like you were talking about well the example was given in the book about um boys not showing interest in girls um i think they there's two types, I suppose. I think there's the boys that are just naturally distracted while they're playing games or the call to competitive play with their friends is mm. more, uh, I don't know, more of a driving factor than whatever girls are in the room, you know, in, in, in the case of this mm. party. And then there's the, the boys that basically, they're not. it's not that they're not interested, it's that they already deem themselves as not ever being able to mm. be with someone because yeah, they're just yeah. not at that caliber or that social status. Yeah. So they they live out their fantasies in that game right there'll be there'll be yes, females yeah. female video game characters or or whatever that they're obsessed with that they'll have posts i know mm -hmm. it's, it's quite extreme but it's the reality like there's uh they'll ha they'll just be fascinated with all these women in the games that don't exist wow. right but they are their mm. perfect sort of representation mm. and then the mm. real world people are and just not on their they they feel like they'll never be able to to get to their level so what's the point you know mm. yeah and i suppose that's that is the the actual key problem here is that the game can actually replace the 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 boy here it can replace his kind of motivation to go out and try and improve mm. like improve your social mm. status improve your social skills improve your whatever your ability to be good at whatever yeah. thing it's like because I find those things, obviously it's not the same, but as long because I have this alternative in the game, let me just do the game. Mm, and, and but the, the the truth is, you know, you're going to play a game and you're going to reach 25, 30. You're going to realize, well, you know, I can't exist like yeah. this without these skills and stuff that I should have been picking up when I was Definitely. younger. Sorry. Um, another, sorry. <laughs> the, another thing is that none of these issues are isolated. Like, we could talk about video games yes, in an isolated yeah. fashion but you know one could say that with it comes not with it because of it but like a, a person can be doing a lot of other things as well that also have an, that also negate their skills and their uh, capabilities in life yeah. for example for example when it comes to like this female thing for example it could be pornography it could mm. be which is completely normal yeah, which is that, completely yeah. normal for them 
you know, for for mm. for non-Muslims or for you know the general West, it's such a norm to engage yourself in that behavior to satisfy yourself in that sort of realm and that arena, right? So your your interaction with uh, you know the opposite gender or or you know forget marriage and put put that to the side, like that's how they satisfy that carnal desire, and then your desire for yeah, competitiveness yeah. and and you know this inner sort of sense of chivalry and warfare and whatever you've got that's done through video games you know and mm-hmm. then these two kind of key things that exist within a man are then satisfied yeah. artificially through mm-hmm. yeah fast food yeah version, exactly yeah. and uh it's just i don't know if i don't know if that's sort of a good I don't know if he speaks about that in that book I don't know if it's a good sort of example but I'd argue that that's probably one of the main issues yeah he did he did mention um the whole pornography yeah. thing he mentioned that a lot and it, he said it, it it comes a lot alongside this video game thing and another link that has maybe to this type of person living this lifestyle is again if you're disengaged from school maybe you just feel like I suck at school and as a 15 year old the main thing to do is school yeah. right? like to succeed in so school or maybe sports and if i suck at both of them then i've got to be good at something i've got to feel good about myself somehow so let me get good at this game yeah so it's it's connected like you said um and he mentioned he, he spoke quite a lot about the uh, other negative effects of games uh, in terms of the violence in these games and he talked about how uh, I, I, uh, to be honest with you, I was skeptical of this part because I thought I've read arguments okay. either way. Okay, um, you know, saying it doesn't really have an effect, and some people saying it's terrible; it causes people to go and shoot mm. up schools and stuff. Um, he very strongly and he advocated for the latter that it has a very negative effect when you're playing violent games. He said you, the the player feels less human, and he starts to see others really? as less human. He loses he loses empathy. Um, and uh, uh, all of these kind of, kind of, I guess you could call it general social skills or emotional intelligence kind of yeah. goes down the drain. Um, and he said, the benefits is that you get a 0.2% faster reaction time when <laughs> <laughs> when doing something. And he said, I don't think it really yeah. weighs out. I don't think, I, you know, I'm on the camp that there is no correlation whatsoever. And I'm not saying that just out of experience because I'm saying mm-hmm. that out of the count of studies that have been done um and I could be mm. being biased, but I've I just don't see it within myself whatsoever. Like there's no link between mm. that and the real world to me. Like there's a very definitive yeah. uh sort of barrier between what's on the screen and what's out there in real life. For example, mm. one would argue that the amount of video games I've played in my life, that the moment I see a dead body that it doesn't bother me, you know? Or and yeah, it, yeah it does you know and it it really mm. does so i know that's just a very you know mm. very quick example but it's the same with anything yeah. like mm. it just i think there's there might there might be an argument to say that there's people with certain predispositions or certain triggers and that doesn't help them but then i think yeah. those people would just be triggered by anything really if the potential is there then anything yeah. can trigger them whether it's a movie whether it's a, an emotion whether it's any sort of influence mm. someone told them to do something mm. you know if mm. someone's got it in them i don't think this yeah. develops it but mm. there's outliers and everything mm. isn't there there's always outliers yeah that, that that's what i was going to say is that when when they do this research and they do studies they're not if they come to the conclusion for example that these like specifically violent games cause people to lose empathy or yeah. whatever they they're not saying that everyone who plays a game will lose mm. empathy but they're saying on average it will happen more to people who are playing games yeah. than not playing games yeah. that's basically what what the study kind of will conclude you know myself my you know my experience is that you know for for many years now i've not really been playing games i've not been watching many films yep. right and i do definitely find myself more sensitive now to death violence um and these kind of more like vulgar things yeah. basically uh i i uh well i haven't played a game for a long time but uh i watched a film uh, a while ago and i just felt it when somebody was killed in this yeah. film i really just felt it and i felt i felt bad for them i felt you know 
like my my emotions actually got engaged in it and i it wasn't in the sense of getting sucked into the story it was purely in the sense of killing is so evil that it was that kind of maybe more of a primal yeah. instinct of this is just evil kind of thing so i definitely and I, I you know i used to watch a lot more films i used to play games um gta i don't know if you know the game uh, manhunt yeah and and this is what manhunt is terrible this, this is what sort of uh, the thought I had was that essentially all of these things are just an extension of what er- or already exists as someone's personality. Because going back to the studies, like what are they defining as a violent game? You know, it could be many things. But then if you look mm. deeper into every yeah. single one of these games, then each of them provide a choice. Um, the first choice being that whether you buy a particular game or not, right? Whether you're into yeah. certain things or not. Uh, for example, GTA. Yeah. Let's use GTA as an example because everybody knows what that's about. The second choice yeah. is what do you actually do in that game? The game provides you with choices. It doesn't force you to do particular things. The most violent things uh-huh. in GTA, like running over prostitutes or shooting down a bank or whatever, a lot of them are choices. Mm. A lot of them are things that you mm. choose to do. Uh, a lot of the time, not even part of like it's an optional thing like completely optional it, the, the yeah, game yeah, gives yeah. you the tools to live out whatever you want to live out mm. and you decide what you want to do even like um road sort of sort of road signs and obeying tr- road traffic laws like people do that yeah. in the game like they will just because they get bored they'll obey the road traffic laws they'll stop at the red light <laughs> i yeah, remember exactly. that exactly <laughs> so what i'm saying is that you, it gives you an opportunity to um yeah to live out whatever sort of fantasy you want to live out yes one could say yeah mm. there is there's issues yeah but is there anybody who's ever played gta who's not done those things the- like isn't that part of although it's optional like you can beat the game although in order to beat the game you still need to kill a lot of people right but uh although it's optional like it's part of the game like that's why a lot yeah, of people what, are buying what the I game what i want like, to sort of go on to is that a lot of games these days have a um, morality system embedded in them Loads of games I play, uh, the size of games mm. I play have morality systems. So, the, mm. some of the games I enjoy the most actually are ones where you go through the whole story making decisions, making choices. Some of them are controversial mm. choices, like you'll be faced with two sort of things to do, and you have to pick what you mm. think, what you would do, or what you believe, or what, you, what outcome you'd want to sort of see out of the choice you make. And then you see your choices play out, and then you could replay it another okay. day and make yeah. different choices and see how, what effect that has on the mm. story you know um, yeah. and, that, and that that goes to show like yeah that some of those choices like you could be set with four choices and one of them would be the typical good thing good guy thing to do another one would be a bit obscure or a bit random and then one mm. of them could be just like completely evil you know because yeah. that's that's there whether people I don't think mm. people pick the evil one because they want to be evil I think pick, people pick it out of curiosity to see what would happen mm. yeah, yeah 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 so that's video games i was surprised to see it there but apparently it's a very big problem and i can i can see how it could kind of make you disengage from society and stuff um the next one he's talked about was prescription drugs right okay so this is the whole thing and you've probably heard of like the adhd kind of crisis in america um i think i think uh if i remember correctly 10 percent of boys in the u.s are on some kind of ADHD medicine, Ooh. Um, which is which is crazy. Which is ten uh, percent of boys. I mean, oh, I don't know how many boys there are, but there are three hundred and twenty million Americans. So it's a lot of boys. And I read a long, quite long article the other day about how over diagnosed these boys are. So let's say ten percent are on these drugs. Apparently, only like five percent should be actually be right. on them. Okay, so that's a huge amount of children that's uh millions that's millions of children who are taking these drugs and and they don't need to be taking the drugs and so he was just uh, you know this is a this chapter was a lot about how they are they are what's that word path path pathologizing they, they're basically turning being a normal boy into an illness that's ba- that's kind of what a AD, that's what adhd often has become it's like Oh, he can't sit still in his chair. Therefore, he's not focusing. Therefore, he's, he has to study. Therefore, he's a bad boy. He's he's too energetic. He can't focus. So we need to give him this mm. drug to dumb him mm. down kind of thing. Um, 
and he said it's being used far too often they're far too strong they give high too high of a doses um and he told of many stories of clients he's had where they were on these drugs and the drugs actually weren't helping them really um in the summer holidays they're going off the drugs and you see the real boy come back with his real creativity and his real self um, and then they put him back when he goes to back to school they put him back on the drugs and he's kind of just a dumbed down version he he could focus a little bit better but he's still not able to focus what the impression i got is they're still not focusing uh, to a good yeah. level okay and he said one of these one of these clients i told them look he he's not completely anti medicine like he's like there is a place for it and i usually actually prescribe uh like some of the weaker ones not the typical ones like adderall and, and ritalin yeah. and these ones um and he said i told this person i said get him off the medicine okay and send him to a boys only school yeah he said it changed completely the boy he said he was he it, it turns out he could focus completely fine when he when he went to this boys school he went off his medicine he was focusing absolutely fine he was doing well at school so it shows that there's more to it than just oh he's lacking uh whatever whatever it is that these medicines deal with i think it's is it dopamine or something yeah. like that so so it's it's crazy man it's crazy it's like being a boy is an illness in a way it's insane bro like it makes me, it's just it boggles my mind how we're in this state this day and age where we mm. are just treating boys and girls exactly the same when they're so vastly mm. different and we even talk and joke mm. like modern society jokes and talks about boys and girls being different but then on the on the mm. on paper we're not allowed to say that you know, culture mm. and comedy and, you know, like the pop culture relentlessly just, you know, pokes at the difference between men and women all the time. Yeah. But then on paper, academically, professionally, everything, we're not allowed to treat anyone different. or We don't talk about anyone mm. differently. And it's just, mm. it, it just doesn't make any sense. We're in such like a mm. this weird sort of gridlock now, deadlock, mm. sorry, of like, what do we do? Like, we can't it's just so odd like culture forces you yeah. one way but then the actual what we write down and what plays out and what we these rules that we mm. we we set for ourselves it doesn't make any sense it doesn't yeah. make any sense yeah the funny thing is from my experience when you go to the when you go to the people on the ground who know what they're talking about okay so the the academics who are doing the research and the teachers who are teaching yeah. children every single day that they you know in a few years they're going to teach hundreds of children yeah so they have a lot of experience and it's not like a sample of just 20 50 yeah. kids right both of these are in agreement about the clear differences between boys and girls yeah clear yeah it, like literally read any any study is going to be very clear like it's not even a question um and then go to any school i mean I, you know i was a, i was a teacher for a while and bro, it's like it's day. It's is it's as clear as day, right? You go to a class. You got half boys, half girls. Straight away, you see one in twenty girls will be rowdy, loud, um, not able to sit still, kind of thing. And maybe seven out of twenty boys will yeah. be like that. And it's and it's repeated class after class after class. It's you know, I okay, I did. I only did it for a year. But go to someone who's been doing it for ten years; they'll tell you the same thing. And the teachers that I were learning from, like my mentors, they, they it was not even a point of controversy to them that you would expect different behavior yeah. from boys and girls. You would, you would, not that you would treat them differently in the sense of fairness, but you would use different tactics to get them to behave. So I, you know, I remember being told clearly that. Okay, the boys, if they're being rowdy, or this class has tons of boys, for example, it's 80% boys. Okay, well, then you need to do a lot of comp competitive things. That's really what engages them, and they really like to try and beat yep. each other and this kind of thing, you know? Or the girls, okay, this class has a lot of girls, and a lot of girls, they don't want to, like, put their hand up because they're afraid of being wrong in front of people. And so you need to kind of really encourage them. And this. So it's so obvious for the people yeah. on the ground. Um, but yet there are people... Uh, maybe people who are in the admin side of schools or the people who are fake academics they're the ones pushing this these policies that try and force people to think that they're mm. the same uh, media as well is a big mm. big one the flavor of the day the media are not going to like psychological studies and then come in with what they're saying they're just making it up themselves. and it's sensationalist isn't it and it's whatever sells 
whatever sells papers yeah. that day and, and there. Yeah. I mean, I think right now we've got to a point where saying that boys are different to girls would make the headline, <laughs> you know. So oh, that's maybe a that's that. a good thing in a way. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's that's prescription drugs. I mean, the thing is, you know, parents are trying to do what's best. Um, and And maybe back in the day, you know, there was more sense of authority of the teacher and maybe that's what kept the boys more in check. Um, I don't know. I can't. I can't say it was more of a problem now and then in terms of the pure behavior. I don't know if the behavior was different. But um, uh, another thing, actually, he said, which was interesting, is uh, he talked about in English. There's only one verb for to know something, yeah, which is obviously right. to know, yeah. But in other languages, in German, in French, in in Spanish, there are two types of knowing. Uh, like I know in French, there is connaître, which is to know a person. So you say I know uh -huh. him. You, you'd use one verb and then to say um, I know this subject you use a different verb right yeah savoir so so uh, he said boys need boys better engage with a more experiential type of knowledge where it's like okay I know the anatomy of a frog because I've held it in my hand I've dissected it I've looked at it yeah. this and that whereas a girl might better understand by just purely looking at the diagram so so uh yeah there, there are these different ways of engaging different ways of learning uh and and different motivations even within mm. school so uh it's kind of crazy but yeah just i don't know man i i i definitely see the benefit of drugs um and you know certain people i would even recommend them like uh it seems like you might need something because you're at such a low point that just to get the kick start to get into a good mm. routine you need you might need it right obviously go to a doctor he, he might tell you this but for most most people they just need to uh change their environment the environmental yeah. factors um you know go to school go to a boys school go to a different type of school go to uh you know schools where maybe they do more kinesthetic learning kind of thing. you know these kind of things before you go straight it was the only drugs. that easy Achy. Only these big changes <laughs> yeah, could yeah. be made like at a drop of a hat. Um, well, I think, I think you you can sometimes. It depends on the person, but sometimes, uh, for example, you you know your te teachers are telling you that your son can't focus. You might want to get him checked out by a doctor. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Obviously, the teacher is motivated to get kids on drugs because they just want good behavior. Yeah. They're not. You know, they're not bad people, but that's what they want. And they probably think kids will learn best when they're quiet in a seat. Yeah. So, so they'll tell you that. Now, you could react by, yeah, just go to the doctor. The doctor tells you, yeah, he needs uh, Adderall. Okay, give him Adderall, yeah. yeah? Or you could, you could question the doctor. You could get a second opinion. You could look at different schools in your area. You could read a book like this, which would inform you better. So it is easy sometimes. It is mm -hmm. easy sometimes. Allahu uh, Alam. And, and uh, you know, like, imagine you, you, your son now is twenty years old, and you, you know, and you just discovered the book that I'm telling yeah. you about now. You know that just reading one book sometimes changes everything. Yeah, it you gives know, your perspective uh, opens your mind to uh, you know options you didn't know were yeah. available. So the next one, uh, which was a big one, I wrote this on Facebook. I know you uh, interacted with it. Uh, it's called. He calls it environmental toxins. Yeah. Okay. So he talks a lot about endocrine disruptors, which are basically chemicals in a lot of the plastics and stuff that we uh, interact with on a daily basis. That uh, they're called endocrine disruptors because you're endi en endocrinal. I don't know how you say it. Um, is basically hormones, yeah. right? So uh, a lot of the uh, plastics they release chemicals. You know, you drink out of plastic bottle, and it can have an effect on your hormones. So he talked about some shocking things like. Uh, in a, I think it was in the New York area. Obviously, a lot of people are using water. They're flushing it. They're throwing it down the sink. There's a lot of plastic in the system. They found that, I think it was fish and frogs, that the male fish and frogs were actually developing uh, ovaries and yeah. eggs. Yeah, I remember yeah? reading this. That's the level of hormonal change they're yeah. going through. Um, and then, so he just started it with that story. And then he went on to talk about you know, applying this to humans. And he's saying, you know, the rate at which boys are being born with, uh, you know, issues with their private parts, you know, like basically not fully developed private parts. He said that's gone through the roof. Um, he said, um, 
he, then he talked about like the the brain uh, the physiology of the brain and how you get motivated um and how that's being affected by this and it's affecting boys more than girls because of how the boy's brain is i think compared to a girl's um he also talked about uh, developing testosterone and how it that is affected negatively so he, funnily enough as well he said girls are getting are becoming more feminine and masculine from this whereas boys are becoming kind of neither yeah. in a way and they're kind of just becoming like he made it sound like they're just becoming vegetables where they just do nothing <laughs> um but this was the most shocking chapter for me you know out of all of them um and straight away i just started thinking of okay how can i get rid of all this plastic and stuff uh, because you know my son's still young you know i can i can still have a positive effect in, yeah. in this sense you've got to send them out to the desert like they used to do back in the day and then but yeah. that, that's the wisdom isn't it that that whole notion of of you know the meccan arabs sending their children away to the desert to avoid mm. diseases and, and all these mm. at, being bro, that was then you know that was then yeah like yeah can you imagine yeah. now it's insane because yeah. i do yeah. not doubt for a second that the amount of mass production the amount of manufacturing we have all the sort of way that we consume mm. food um the way food is made the the it's mm. it kind of reminds me of atomic <laughs> habits the book that we mentioned before like atomic habits talks yeah. about making small 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 changes that add up to big uh -huh. sort of vast sort of transformations yeah. right that's the same thing mm. like every day we're making a small change mm. by consuming something or breathing in something yes. or being in a particular environment yes. and every single day it will stack it will stack it will stack until you've got this completely different view and you've seen it before with I mean, they've done studies in terms of environment with twins like they've lived in different sort of areas um and they even look different like they start out looking identical but they end up looking completely mm. different based on the experiences and the environments that they're in mm. um, yeah so yeah. yeah i don't doubt that for a second so going going out to the desert would would definitely help you in the sense of your character building and stuff uh but you know what he said about these toxins is they're equally found in america they're equally found in the countryside as yeah, in cities yeah. um because I think one of the reasons is um, a lot of pesticides have these chemicals yeah. in them. So so if you're in the farming kind of area. So it's it's really tricky, man. It's very, it's very scary, man. Because if you think about... Uh, it's It's been about 50 years since these kind of chemicals started being mass produced and put everywhere, right? Think of... And already, you know, I mean, if you want, you can read the book yourself and, and see the... Because I don't remember the exact changes i know it it messes with testosterone it messes with the motivation it messes with hormones in general it makes the girls go through puberty much right. earlier like three or four years earlier than they normally would okay now imagine that compounded over 100 200 yeah. years and it just made me think of the hadith the prophet he said that um uh, towards the end of time there would be one man looking after 50 women yeah. and it, it might be the case that it's because the men are just like all vegetables <laughs> and there's only a few who are like actually able to take wow. care of things so it's crazy it's man it's it's really it's really shocking it, you know it makes me think okay with my son what am i gonna do okay got to get rid of as many plastics as possible uh, i've got to make sure he's doing exercise you know to help him his development help him uh, maybe develop testosterone you know it comes from uh, exercise you're gonna fry your brain uh, bro gonna... you're gonna fry Sorry? your brain if you start thinking like Why i just that? feel like you're gonna put way too much on yourself that you're just gonna stress mm. so much and i've learned that mm. the best thing you can do is mm. is make your most sincere dua and then do your best mm. and, and take everything as one yeah, step yeah. at a time actually that was one thing i was uh, i was thinking of yeah. as well is that this is why you make yeah, dua. exactly exactly because there is even if you feel you have control over mm. something nothing happens without the permission of allah and then there are these things where you feel completely intimidated by and you feel you have, you have no way of swaying it and that's why you make dua that's why every day you wake up and you say you know allah protect mm. him allah give you know guide him um that's true it, it i guess you know me and you we think differently i think i have a um i think i forgive myself a okay. lot so 
uh, I don't know exactly how that happened, but I got into the habit of forgiving myself a lot. And so if I have a goal and I know there's a lot to be done, um, I can I could say I'm going to do this, 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 and, and this maybe is more for the later, this is more for later. And you know what I mean? So I feel, I don't feel too intimidated by this. I feel like, okay, I can't do 100% of the stuff to protect him from right. this stuff. But I can do 70% and I'm going to do 70%. And if I fail at doing 70%, then why even have kids? Like, surely that's mm. my job, you know? I think for myself, I'm I'm quick to relinquish control. I think a lot of adversities that I've felt in terms of... I think I've been overcome a lot by the responsibilities that across the board, not just my, mm. you know, my immediate family, like my wife and my child, but like my mother mm. and my sisters and work and a lot of responsibilities fall under me even like at work you could argue that there's a lot of responsibilities for people that i've never met before you know that i'm responsible mm. over the general public yeah and i think um i could i could if i wasn't a religious man i could be overcome by this and just completely mm. lose it and i think the one thing mm. and i and i'll be trying to search for the wisdom behind a lot of these challenges I've faced recently and the one thing that I've realized is that my Iman isn't as high in happier days or days where I'm you know, more forgetful of the responsibilities I have than it is when I'm stressed out mm. or when I'm upset or whatever. When I'm upset and I'm stressed out, my Iman is through the roof because my conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is way more sincere and it's way more. And, and it, it will take me to a point where I know that I can't do anything or don't know what to do or what decisions to make. So I naturally relinquish control. And then I make my dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance sincerely. And it's you know one of the duas, my favorite duas is, um, I'm going to put myself on the spot now and I can't remember it. It's, Ya hayu ya qayyum bi rahmatika astaghithu aslih li shatni kulla wa la takilli ila nafsi tarfatayin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a one. That's and the one. That definitely. one. You know, every morning, you know, after Fajr and mm. every afternoon after Asr, um, mm. and I can't get more concise than that. You know, there's a few. Mm. Do you know the translation of it? Essentially, yeah. So yeah, Hayu Yaqiyum, which obviously is the name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You know, the Hay meaning uh, it's. Ever yeah, and it, we could they, we could do whole hours on those sort of names. So I'd recommend getting into those names and studying them properly. Yeah, So by your mercy, like calling upon Allah's mercy, that I astaghith is like begging almost Seek seeking help, help mm. to the point it's like you're begging mm. for it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so make like fix rectify all of my affairs not just like this affair but everything so everything mm-hmm. like it's so c- inclusive like you don't even have to worry about laying out what's in your mind or trying to mm-hmm. translate that mm-hmm. into arabic or whatever because one of the biggest things i struggle with whether it's making dua in english or arabic one would argue oh you surely just make dua in english and you'll be fine i can't even put into words what i want a lot of the time because mm-hmm. i don't Mm. You don't. Sometimes you have an issue. You don't even know what the solution is, so you don't even know how to ask for it. You know. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. But what you can do is understand that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala fully understands what you're going through more than you ever know, would, and understands mm. what would bring peace to your heart, and understands. You know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala just wants to see you make these kind of du'as and this connection to Him. But Ahmedka Stagheed, Sahli Shatni Kulla Wala Takilli Ina Nafsi Tarfatain, and do not let me, do not leave me to sort of uh, yeah do devices. not leave me to my own devices for even a blink of an eye or is it it's either for even a blink of an eye as in time or even a blink of an eye so even there's something as small as a blink of an eye don't let me sort mm. of be in control of that mm. you know? yeah. I, I can't i'm not That's... sure if it's the time so even for like a split second yeah. don't leave me to my own devices or mm. um the action mm. like even if i was to mm. blink like, blinking, it, like yeah. don't let me be in control yeah. of my own blinking or it could be both yeah, there could yeah, be wisdom yeah. in both mm. both those mm. sort of translations that's crazy bro if you think about it like asking asking your creator to not leave anything up to yeah. you like that's that's the next level that's a you know what what religion what philosophy teaches you yeah. that level of um uh, 
level of submission, level of trust, level of. And amazing. and I think the most important thing, like the the only thing that will ever affect du'a is your sins, like like in terms of your conviction and how you're going to be answered, because you will feel if you're committing a sin or you're up to no good or whatever, and then you're making these du'as, then one you would feel in your heart that actually Allah has. I mean, Allah always has the right not to answer and not to respond, mm. right? In terms of not to give you what you want. But for your own peace of mind, you can't rationalize it if you're committing a particular sin. You're making this dua and you just feel like you're not being sincere because you're not putting in the effort. You're not putting in the work. You're not putting mm. in the... How can you ask Allah for when you need something, but then you're not necessarily obeying mm. him, you know? Yeah. So when you get rid of those yeah. sins and those obvious ones and the ones that you're aware of, and then you make du'as like this and you're sincere like this that's where I feel mm -hmm. for myself at least I could say mm. right I have no worries in the sense that this is where I need to be right now you know I've made this du'a mm -hmm. I'm sincere in Allah's response I'm sincere that I believe that Allah mm -hmm. has responded or Allah will respond or Allah will guide me based on these sincere du'as I'm making so right this second where I am right now this is where I'm meant to be you know because what's mm -hmm. stopping you from and I remember this happened the other day like and I'm not trying to open you know, open up my secret worship or whatever. But I made this du'a sincerely because I was having a very, very tough time uh, with something, mm -hmm. and um, and it was after Asr prayer, and I was at work, so I'd, I'd just done it, and I thought, okay, and I sat there for a bit, and I thought, okay, if a, if there's meant to be a change in my life, obviously it would happen right now, and if there isn't, if the change meant to come later, then it will happen later, you know. But I believe that Allah mm -hmm. Subhanahu wa Taala has heard what I've said, and and then I turned my phone around, and there was some messages. Um, from a family member and it was like oh we've got another problem something else has come up do you understand and i just mm. thought well then this is what's meant to happen this test is meant to continue or this 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 new test is part of the do you understand it kind of rationalized it to me yeah. and made it made me remember actually this is just the dunya and this is what this is about it's about test after test after mm. test and yeah there'll be moments of mm. ease and then there'll be moments of hardship and it, and that made me understand it and then i realized that it can never get too bad it can never get worse than it needs to be because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never test you beyond what what you're capable of but it mm. also means that these tests are good for you like this is shaping you into something that you need to be or it's preparing you for maybe you know the afterlife or giving you the good deeds or expiating your sins etc etc like there's always a wisdom behind it so yeah yes. Allah subhanahu wa yeah. ta'ala may continue to test you. you may see that you're strong enough to bear these tests and the fruits of these tests will be seen at a later date you know but yeah yeah i think you know what self-help books you know written by non-muslims they kind of they put it into your head that you're you should take control yeah. of your life right you should take responsibility for your life and a lot of people need to hear that but what they will never tell you is that once you take a responsibility for everything in your life that you then need to take it further and like rely on yeah. allah and ask allah and obviously they're not going to tell you that because they don't even believe in Allah. And so because I've been in these books so much, I think it pushed me more towards that yeah. side. And I'm very focused on action, which is good, but you just need both, you know. You definitely need both. It's definitely. It's like a it's a, it's a double-edged sword because you need to be responsible for your obedience to Allah. I think that's one thing that isn't spoken about. Like you could... You know, you're, on Yom Al-Qiyamah, when you're questioned, then you were responsible for your own actions in the sense that you're the one who should have worshipped, who should have stayed away from sin, who should have X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when your judgment ends, and, you know, when your judgment ends, you won't be left You will be left with any sort of questions mm -hmm. as to, you know what I mean? Like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most just, so mm -hmm. his, his verdict, as it were, is unquestionable. Mm -hmm. You're not going to say, oh, but, no, that's not fair, or you're going to realize by the end of that judgment that you deserved what you got, whatever, whether that's Jannah or Jahannam, you know? Um, mm. But as opposed to saying everything that happens in your life, in the dunya, is your control, then that sets everybody up to fail because what happens is then, no matter how many right choices you make, if something's not written for you, then you're always going to mm. be kicking yourself thinking that oh if only yeah. i did this differently if only did that differently that's why you need this element of yeah. you know trusting in allah or knowing that there's things that are written for you then things that aren't there's maslaha in certain things and mefsada in certain things that you would have never guessed you know mm. and it's about relinquishing that control 
yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Bro. So, bro, by the way, the final, the fifth uh, element, which I haven't finished yeah. the book yet, but the fifth element is devaluation of masculinity. He says, shifts in popular culture have transformed the role models of manhood. 40 years ago, we had Father Knows Best, which I think yeah. is a show. And today we have The Simpsons. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So this, he talked a lot about how, uh, for example, he talked a lot about women that wrote into him uh, complaining about their husbands and how they're just waiting for their husband to grow up yeah. still. And their husband's like 35 and he works part time and then he just plays video games the rest of the time. And uh, the, meanwhile, the woman's like earning a huge salary and she's still taking care of a lot of things in the house because he just doesn't do it. And I think what this maybe what we should call this episode is the creation of the man child yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we talked about that in the past in previous episode which was a really good episode but what we maybe didn't cover is the the factors that are not so much in our control like you know how how did how do we know that there's this stuff in in you know plastic yeah. bottle <laughs> bottles and how do how do we how do we have control over these chemicals in in what we're eating what we're drinking how do we know about oh we're sending our kids to schools and they're being disengaged because of the curriculum yeah or like you know what i mean so a, a lot of the time yanni you can always find a reason to blame someone and then also to not blame definitely them, you know almost equally sometimes um, but i think what it means for me is that we need to take responsibility for it no no matter, no matter what yeah so there's plastic in in my water it's going to mess with mine and my son's hormones um it's not my fault but i will take responsibility for it okay so i will be buying glass instead of plastic for example yeah um and i just think there are a few there are a few key things you know we could take from this inshallah yeah so one of the things is just do a little little reading little learning about the endocrine disruptors you know get rid of plastic as much as you can i think that's kind of the 80 20 of that yeah and then i think the way i want to raise my son is like allow him to have you know a similar childhood to me or maybe even better in the sense of playing outside mm. i want him to be playing outside i want him to be playing with other boys i want him to be doing some kind of sport you know whatever sport yeah. he enjoys but the point is to be outside not be on a phone or or in front of a screen and uh, be engaging himself uh, when it comes to learning uh i don't really mind what he ends up like specializing in if you like but you know i uh, for now i think maybe uh, a hybrid maybe of homeschooling with some kind of group learning together i think that'll be good depends where you live and yeah. what's available um and i think what and then also obviously myself being a, a good role model for him i think these maybe also spending time with distant more distant family like uncles aunts and these things i just listed like six things i think which inshallah are quite doable and if you did these six things i think it would help with a lot of what we discussed mm, in this episode you know definitely i think for for myself you know just to round it up as far as my son um is to develop a strong connection with him like for myself because yeah uh mm. like my biggest growing up and, and you know my dad now doesn't live in the same country and i don't see him that much and because of that not only the age gap the vast age gap we have with each other the culture gap we have with each other but the, now the distance that we have with each other there's a lot of reg regrets regrets and a lot of things that i sort of wish we'd built up that are very difficult to try and build up now not that i don't try but but yeah i want that sort of ability to just talk to my son and the ability for him to talk to me um and the ability yeah. to see things from his perspective and vice versa and to 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 not to to give them a bit more responsibility than just treating them like a child forever you know um mm, for example yeah. little things it could be tiny things like the other day i was putting up a shelf and immediately he was interested in my tool but I say toolbox it's like a small little collection of screwdrivers <laughs> but he was interested in that and you know the gut reaction in me was to tell him put it down you're gonna hurt yourself you know or leave or let mm. me do this and then I thought well no let him just yeah. sit here with me playing with tools why not like yeah. do you understand it's a moment well played it's a, well played it's a moment isn't it and it's a moment that yeah. is nothing to me but everything to him yeah 
and that's mm. the reality it's mm. a moment that we yeah. we devalue because it's it's mundane and they it's, they cherish because it's completely new and it's fascinating mm. yeah yeah like uh oh, what's his name stephen covey in the book uh, seven habits of highly effective people one of those habits is seek to understand before being understood mm. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about is if you don't have a relationship with someone, you'll never be able to influence them yeah. positively. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ did. This is why certain people accepted Islam just because the Prophet ﷺ was the way he was. Without any, they're like, oh, this guy saying there's there's a God and there's a revelation and, uh, uh, you know, uh, day yeah. of judgment. Oh, yeah. I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm down. So that's definitely key, man, having that good relationship. And you know, sometimes relationship relationship doesn't have to mean spending five hours a day with your son. It could be, you know, like the email I sent to you, you know, about these little moments you get with with your kids yeah. or with your family, whoever it is. Um, sometimes it's about quality. Obviously, there is a minimum time needed, but it doesn't always mean the more the better. Perhaps. Yeah, it's know? it's just. I think yeah, that email was talking about how we expect to sort of. Uh, we have to create grand events to cherish these special times or make special times, quality time, I think it was called, when actually all yes. time is quality and all time is special uh, and all time mm -hmm. has meaning. And it's often the mundane things that we remember more than the, mm -hmm. the big vast experiences. Mm -hmm. I think because the vast experiences, mm -hmm. it could be anything like, oh, we'll take, let me take you to the zoo, something big like that, or let's go mm -hmm. to this show or let's, those things yeah. the, the actual event itself sucks away from the time you've spent together like you don't remember mm. like if you've ever taken your family somewhere special it could even be on holiday bro it could be far then you're you're more likely to remember the things you saw as opposed to the time you spent together and what was said with each other yes. whilst if, if it's something completely mundane then actually the attention is more on the individual that you're with it's more on your son mm. in this case um, mm. like taking your son just to the park which is at least for us, it's quite mundane. Then I'm more focused on him and watching him and observing him and seeing how he reacts. Like us, something that fascinated me was like seeing how he reacts with other children. Uh, like there was mm. this, and it's really just a brief one. Like he he was going down a slide and this other random kid went down behind him and this kid mm. slid straight into the, his back and I was like, oh my god, this yeah. is a bit of hello, Baba. This is a bit of confrontation. How is he going to react to this? You know, I've never seen him yeah. like that. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. seeing him turn around and, and t shout at this kid saying, what, what's going on? I was like, oh, my, <laughs> my son like, can speak up for himself. That's interesting. You know, instead of running to me yeah. and crying that he's got hit in the back, I have observed him mm. fending for himself. And I'm thinking, how has he developed that? Where has he learned that from? Where's that confidence come from? Mm. I must be doing something mm. right to sort of teach him that confidence. Yeah, very good. Yeah. But yeah. That's, that's um, but yeah, he's here now and he's going to. Are you going to sign us out today, man? Just, yeah. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bro. We have to call it. Yeah, bro. So, in conclusion, this is a very good book. They, he also wrote a similar book for girls. So, if you've got um, if you've got oh, girls no. or you're just interested, I then like. check it out. Yeah. And uh, if you want to ask us any questions, make any comments, then go to mindheistpodcast.com. You can ask uh, anonymous questions or send us emails from there. And yeah, very good episode, bro. So, so say bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Why are you whispering? Why you scream out there. Um, whispering. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. Say bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Oh. Yalla. Assalamu Thanks for listening. <laughs> Okay, yalla, wa alaikum as-salam wa rahmatullah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Shadu anna ilaha la anta. Astaghfiruka atubu ilayk.